Ready. So thank you all for making it. It's uh, it's um, 12:53. So we're going to try to keep this under an hour. I know it's a long day, and we're all um, tired from liturgy and whatnot. So let's try to keep it short and simple. Uh, until more people come, I just want to make an announcement. I'm not really sure if you've heard of something known as Theology Academy. Have you ever heard of it before? Okay. For those of you who've never heard about it before, the diocese under the auspices and under the supervision of His Grace, Bishop Emba Yusuf, Bishop Emba Basil, and Bishop Emba Gregory, we've launched this new platform called Theology Academy. So a lot of people, when they hear the word theology, they think it's time to, you know, pack, pack, and go to theology school, right? Uh, nowadays, it's very busy, right? We have a lot of work to do. We have families and whatnot. Plus, we can't all afford to go to theology school. Theology school, uh, yani, to get proper theological training at a scholarly level, you know, you're paying almost $20,000 a year for a good two or three years. And then, you know, postgraduate training, it's, it's very costly. Besides that, the market for theology nowadays is decreasing in the academic world. So if I want to become a professor of cardiology, it's way easier than becoming a professor of theology. Okay. Why? Because there's a demand for the sciences, for engineering, for all these disciplines more than, the, more than theology. And even the academic worlds nowadays, they're trying to um, introduce more of the psych psychology, theology, interdisciplinary fields as a means of... Um, enhancing the departments of theology and religion to get more funding. So not everyone can afford to go to theology school. Not everyone will have the time to go to theology school. But at the same time, there's a huge danger as servants that we meet on a daily basis with the upcoming generations, right? The danger is... Um, we currently have, you know, search engines, SEO, Google, and whatnot. I'm not really sure how many of you in Sunday school you talk and your kids are fact-checking everything on Google, right? Uh, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, maybe there's other sources, maybe you're, you know, you're talking Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, whatever it is. The whole point is the kids now have access to everything, anytime, anywhere. Okay. Now, that's good and bad at the same time. It's good to have a, you know, a plenitude of knowledge, but at the same time, it is important to present the facts and the data in an appropriate manner. Okay. Um, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, a lot of us get into the controversy. Is Genesis 1 true or not? It's probably not true because there's something known as the theory of evolution that says otherwise. Right? There's no creator. Okay, uh, that's the easiest thing anyone can say. But do we understand the context of Genesis 1? Do we understand the content of Genesis 1? Who wrote Genesis 1? Who did he write it for? Where? When? What is the meaning of Genesis 1? Was Genesis 1 just purely history? Or was it theological? Or was it both? What was it? I'll tell you something, maybe a lot of us don't know this. Genesis 1 was read in the Jewish liturgical synaxis every week, in the Jewish liturgical meeting. And it was a liturgy. It was kind of like a liturgical text that was chanted. How do we know that it was liturgical? There's a refrain that says, there was evening, there was morning. There was evening, there was morning. And it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. That was like, you know how in, in, in Tazbaha we say, or right? You know, this repetition indicates that it's a doxology. Can you imagine that Genesis 1 was a theological doxology in the Jewish synaxis? It contains historical elements. It tells us how the world came into existence, but it's not going to tell you the entire story. It's not going to tell you the entire details of history. So we need to understand the context. 
you know, a lot of us get really, really shaken by, oh my, because there's evolution and because the kids are hearing this or that, then the Bible and our teaching is at risk. No, it's not. Really? Are we that weak to sometimes face what they're saying? We need to teach them the context of Scripture, the content of Scripture, etc. So, um, Theology Academy is this platform that tries to bring the, you know, the big theology stuff that you would see in a theological institution, a seminary or a university. It tries to bring it down to the level of laity, to the level of the general public. And what we've agreed upon with His Grace is that we present to you all the academic facts from all points of view as long as they adhere to a, some historical basis. There is no tradition, there is no religion that is true that will not be proven historically or that will not be proven academically. If you go back to our early roots in the Church of Alexandria, everything in history testifies that everything that we've said in theology is to a large extent very well aligned with the message of the Logos. It's very fascinating. So, Theology Academy, uh, you can find, uh, obviously the website is theology-academy.org. We're trying to, you know, revamp things uh, uh, website-wise. But more importantly, you'll find the videos, which is, Theology Academy is a video platform, okay? We're not interested in giving lectures or one hour or two hour lectures or, no, no, no. If the topic is big, we'll break it into 10-minute videos, put it in a series. You know, it's a bite size for you to, to, to learn and to, uh, uh, or sorry, your servants, for you to use as a complementary to your teaching in Sunday school. So, for example, if you're teaching your, your children and you want to complement whatever it is, show them the video, Okay. The videos are very short, simple, and concise, and to the point. However, I would advise you to go through the entire series. Don't just, you know, cherry pick a video and that's it. Actually, let's let's ha you know let's do this exercise together. Do you guys have your iPhones or phones with you? Bring them out, please. Okay, go to YouTube. I do this exercise with all the servants. Please bear with me. Go to YouTube. Go to Theology Academy. Right? Type Theology Academy. Okay. Do you see a cross on top of a globe? Black and white? Okay. Click subscribe. You're done with the subscription? Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Make it personalized. Make that. Trust me, we're not going to bug you. It's just one or two videos a week, and the video is literally five to ten minutes. That's it. Okay? But the people who write the scripts, we collaborate with some of the top-notch institutions with top access to manuscripts, primary sources. We're trying to milk it you know, from the early roots of Christianity. This is not, you know, subjective, contemporary teaching. We're trying to bring it as early as the early roots of Christianity. If you're an Arabic fan, we have the page, Bal Arabi. All you need to type on YouTube, Al Akademiya Al Lahutayya. Okay? If you type Al Akademiya Al Lahutayya, you'll find the cross on top of the globe. Hit subscribe. Ring the bell, and more importantly, try to spread it. This is new form of basically catering theology in a very simple, in a very structured manner. If you're a, okay, if if your first language is Arabic, watch the videos in Arabic. If your first language is English, watch the videos in English. It will it will really be. Uh, it, it's not going to do you justice if you're you know, more on the English side and watch the Arabic videos or vice versa. The English is very, you know, it's only only people who, who grew up here will understand that type of English. The Arabic is the same. So I, I really encourage you to, to watch it 
um, and communicate it to Oh yeah, yeah, for the service, for the sake of the Sunday school, obviously, yes, uh, presented in English. But I mean, for your own benefit, if you are stronger in Arabic, watch the Arabic. So, so far we've begun with the series like Church Fathers, Church History, uh, Biblical Archaeology, which is a very interesting discipline, but it's also studied in the seminary. Uh, you know... The, are all the locations that we read in the Bible, are they all magic or are they true? Okay. Um, what, what is the scientific evidence behind Jericho, behind uh, 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 I, behind uh, Caprinium, behind Nazareth, behind all these cities? Biblical studies. We have Old Testament series and New Testament series. The stuff that I was talking to you about in Genesis. We're, we've started covering it in full detail. So anyhow, I'll make this announcement again in brief at the end. But make sure to utilize this because this, uh, to be honest with you, uh, Yanni, Yanni, it's it's more or less the new way of catering education to the younger generations. Uh, uh, you know, being in academia for, for several years now, I could tell you that teaching in the in the academic or in the university environment is going downhill you know the the you know the stereotype professor with a blackboard and giving a lecture that stuff is fading away that stuff is no longer you know in existence anymore coursera online courses online videos that's the that's the mode of teaching nowadays and i think we should you know uh, strive to serve the church by bringing the teaching of the church to that standard or to that mode of um, of uh, communication. Any questions in that regard? Okay. So Abuna asked me to talk about a controversial topic that we have a lot of different opinions uh, on as Christians. Different denominations have different opinions. But we as the Coptic Orthodox Church have a very solid you know, definition for justification. First of all, what is justification? What does it mean to be justified? What is justification? Saved? Uh, a, a mode of an excuse or to be justified yes any any other ideas sorry yes justification means like you could be you know you could get a check mark for being righteous or right in that regard before god absolutely yes uh, do, can you elaborate Perfect. So acceptance before God as being righteous or being justified. Not out of, you know, it's not me who's being righteous or being, you know, it's I am justified. No, no, no. It's by putting yourself in front of God. God sees you as the image of his son. He accepts you into the kingdom. You're, you're, you're saved. You're justified in that regard. Very good. Any other ideas? Yes. That's what we're going to get into. But we're asking so far, what is justified? What is justification? Okay, so yes. Forgiveness, atonement, right? You're, you're forgiven, you're atoned for a certain iniquity, therefore you become righteous, therefore you become justified. Perfect. Yes? Guaranteed a place in heaven? Yes. In, uh, in, in, um, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Okay. You are guaranteed a spot or so in heaven. Okay. Or a place. Very good. Any other ideas on what justification is? Okay. Very good. So these are all correct answers. Justification 
save, uh, uh, redemption, salvation. These are all synonymous terms. But my talk today is going to be on how to be justified. How to be justified. So, many Christians will read Scripture like, for example, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Who are we talking about here? And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. I want the younger servants to start responding. All the uncles are responding. Come on. Who are we talking about? Abraham. Bravo. Okay. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. This is in the book of Acts. Again, by faith or by believing, they were justified. Now, unfortunately, and this relates again to the topic that we covered yesterday, there are many interpretations. There are many schools of thought when it comes to interpreting the Bible, right? So some people read and, you know, he believed or he had faith and it was counted to him as righteousness or justification. Khalas. All you need to do is believe. We believed in Jesus Christ, right? Do whatever you want. Ba. You already believed, you're going to be saved no matter what. But life in Christ and life in the church is not unipolar. It is bipolar. It is a mutual relationship. Okay? There is no man without a woman and no woman without a man. Even, even you know, regardless if you're married or not, I'm just talking about, you know, just in general in the creation. When he created them, even in the animals, he created them in that variety as two. Even the trees, there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil and there's the tree of life. There's the path of darkness and there's the path of evil. There's, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, Christ alone will grant us salvation. For sure. He saved us on the cross. For sure. But it is our role to accept the salvation. You're going to ask me, okay, very good. He died on the cross and I accepted the salvation and lo, and lo and behold, here I am in church. I am saved. I'm going to say no. Salvation is not a one-time process. It is a continuous process. You're going to tell me, wait, what does a continuous process mean? I'm going to tell you, if you're going to read the Bible from the, um, the, the Pauline or the, the theology of St. Paul, the theology of St. John the Evangelist, the theology of the Alexandrian school of thought, which we had in the school of Alexandria, if you read that, continu continuity means eternity. So you're going to tell me, wait a second. The salvation mean, I said salvation is continuous. It's a continual process. So does that mean it's eternal? Well, it was in the plan of God, and therefore it was eternal, right? Let's read together Revelations 13. What does it say about the Lamb? If we read it according to the Greek and the Coptic translation, it says that the, the Lamb was slain since when? The Lamb was slain since? Since the foundation of the world. It's so interesting. Now, who was in the foundation of the world? Did we exist since the foundation of the world? We didn't come into existence. But this salvation was being prepared for. It was in the mind of God. It was in the economy of God even before we were in existence. So just imagine, uh, you know, a horizontal line or an x-axis, okay, where the left side, you know, you have an arrow pointing to minus infinity or negative infinity, okay, backwards infinity, back in time. And then the right here is positive infinity. So salvation, when I, it was in the mind of God even before the foundation of the world. Very good. Now, what else? 
does that eliminate that there was an actual time in, you know, 43 AD or where, whenever it was, 34 AD, when Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of the living God, was crucified on the cross? No. Just because salvation has been ever since, it doesn't eliminate the historical event. There was a time when Christ Jesus was on the cross, you know, hung on the cross in 34 or whenever it was, A.D. But just imagine the cross in the center here basically is uniting everything, all the ages, all the time. Before and after the cross, everything is united in that person of the crucified Lord. He is the Savior on the cross on Mount Golgotha. I saw him on Mount Golgotha in 34 AD, but he has been always slain since the foundation of the world. So salvation is eternal, is continuous. Until when? When does this salvation end? It never ends. It's a continuous process. Can you imagine that's how much love God has for us? That He is ready to die for us since the foundation of the world. And that He continuously sacrifices Himself. This one-time sacrifice on the cross is continuously being prepared for us on the altar. Sorry, can I have the questions at the end? If you don't mind. All the processes that happened between the creation all the way to the cross and from the cross till the second coming of Christ, all this is united in the one sacrifice of the cross. And every time I come here on Sunday, what does God do? He's like, by the way, that cross, that story that you saw on Golgotha, here I am. I'm manifesting it to you in the bread and in the in the in the bread and wine every Sunday. This is the same sacrifice two thousand years ago. This is the same thing now. It's amazing. There's something in the liturgy known as anamnesis. Have you ever heard of the anamnesis? Okay, an anamnesis means the commemoration, to commemorate. Okay? Uh, when, when, when Abuna says, do this in remembrance of me, a lot of the Christian denomination says, okay, this is a remembrance. Yani, wahad met, and we're remembering him. If you go back again to the Greek origin of the term, anamnesis means you're reliving the event as if it was happening now. The event is continuous now. Can you imagine? So what do we remember or what do we commemorate? Or in other words, what do we relive? We relive the sacrifice of the cross presented for the world on Mount Golgotha ever since the foundation of the world. It's beautiful, right? It's a beautiful mystery. Very good. Is this the end of the story? I mean... This is what God did for us. He gave up himself in his he gave up his life in his son for as a ransom for the whole world. Khalas, we're saved? Just because I believe and just because I say I believed God, Khalas, I'm saved? No. But what do I do? I need to go uh, 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 you know, become baptized. Halas, you're saved when you're baptized? No. I'll go take communion. Halas, you're saved? No. I sinned and I need to go confess. You're saved? No. If the sacrifice was a continuous process, your salvation is also a continuous process. If the sacrifice is eternal and everlasting, your salvation in Christ is eternal and everlasting. We don't believe that, for example, you go into uh, uh, the baptismal font, you come out, done, you're saved. We don't believe that. You can get baptized today, tomorrow, commit adultery or go kill if you're an adult, right? 
that happens. But what keeps the salvation reignited within you? It's like you know, the, 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 the sacraments that we partake of, those, those are like tokens, a token of salvation, a token of the continuous salvation that we partake in. Like Abuna said in uh, al uh, Arabi, you have to take care of that oil. It needs to continue to burn. You have to take care of it. Christ has given it to you ever since the foundation of the world. But I need to take care of my baptism. I need to take care of my Eucharist. I need to take care of my life. I need to take care of my communion with others because I'm not an isolated island of my own. As soon as you partake the body and the blood of Christ, who are you, who are you united with? You're united with Christ and who? Everyone else. That's why a church with disputes or enmity or, you know, people are not getting along together, there is no, uh, I mean, sorry to sound blunt, there is no salvation for its members. The salvation entails me abiding in Christ and all the members of the body of Christ. So I have a role to play. I have a role to play not just by believing, but by being inducted into the sacraments of the church. Now, why do I always focus on the sacraments? How many sacraments do we have in church? Seven sacraments. Okay? Why do I focus on the sacrament? What is the sacrament called? The sacrament is called mysterion, right? It's a mystery. A mystery is something above my comprehension. It's above the boundaries of time and space. I cannot understand a sacrament. Tell me philosophically, how does the bread and wine become the blood and body of Christ? Tell me. It, show me the equation. How do you go into the water and come out as uh, putting on Christ? How? I, I, I went in as Mina, I came out as Mina. I don't see Christ. Where is Christ? A mystery is a mystery. You cannot understand what goes on within it. However, you can experience it. You can experience it in your life. I said that the sacrifice of Christ is eternal, is continuous, and is everlasting. Christ has given me this salvation ever since the foundation of the world. How can I truly be saved and be partaker of this mystery? I need to put myself into the mystery. I need to put myself on the road of the mysteries and the sacraments. And let's go over all the sacraments together because all of these are necessary for my salvation. All of these are necessary for my salvation. Yes, we have seven categories or seven sacraments, but there are also sub uh, you can think of it as sub-practices within the sacraments that enrich my life in Christ. So first sacrament is baptism. What happens in baptism? Or before baptism, you know, as the Protestants would love, they, you, need to believe in Christ. You need to have faith in Christ and then jump into the baptismal font. Okay, what happens in baptism? St. Paul says it clearly. You put off the old man, and you put on the man. Very good. St. Athanasius and all the church fathers say, this is the sacrament of enlightenment. Why? We all have the image of Christ within us. But how do we make it apparent? How do we manifest it to people? By being baptized in the baptismal font. When you become baptized in the baptismal font, you put on the image of Christ. Now, St. Paul says something very intriguing about the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is a process of what? Dying. <laughs> yani, congratulations. If you want to become a Christian, what do you need to do? 
like from the very first moment of your induction as a Christian, how do I become saved? I believe in Christ Jesus. That's it? No, 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 no. You need to die. You need to die. And we don't feel it because we've given baptism when we were young children. Right? We don't feel what the penalty of baptism is. But in the early church, I want you to imagine that this door here is the entry into the church. Anyone, any foreigner, any pagan coming through that door, they would tell him, please go outside. Say, I want to become a Christian. Admit me into the church. They're like, no, 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 no. You have no idea what's going to happen to you. They're like, what do you mean? Obviously, in the first three centuries, it was the era of persecution. So if you were labeled with the mark of Christianity, if you were to go into the baptismal font, your end fate is? Your end fate is? Death. And I want you to, to, to envision baptism as this very long, continuous process. You know how I said salvation is like a continuous, it's like on the timeline of continuity? Baptism, our means of being saved, is also this really long thing, long time frame, okay? Expanded upon the time axis. Its culmination, the culmination of baptism is in one's death. So the martyr or the person who was inducted into Christianity, they would be baptized here and their perfection of this baptism or the culmination of this baptism would be in their, in their martyrdom. That's why St. Tertullian said, or Tertullian, he said that if you, if you die for the sake of Christ and you shed your blood, this will be accounted for you as, as baptism. The 21 martyrs of Libya, one of them was an Ethiopian, uh, his name was Matthew, right? And apparently he was not a Christian. Was he a Christian? He wasn't a Christian. But he, he was preached, it was preached to him the word of truth by his colleagues, by others around him. And he converted into Christianity. Did he have time to, be, to get baptized into water? No. Did he die a martyr's death? Was this his baptism? Yes. Tab Anna. Me. I, I, I mean, I don't go to Libya to get martyred. I'm here in North America. What do I do? Ah, no. If you die with Christ, you need to continue dying with Him. This death doesn't end. And that's why salvation is not like a one-time espresso shot. You know what I mean? It's not like Abuna gives you salvation. You know, as an injection, you're done. It, it doesn't happen that way. And we sometimes think of baptism as like this one-time shot. Khalas, you're good to go. No. No, 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 no. It's a continuous process. How do I renew my uh, baptism? Through what sacrament? What needs to be washed? If I'm already washed, what else in my body needs to be washed continuously because it gets dirty? My feet, right? What is that? The repentance and confession. A lot of people will repent to Christ and will offer forgiveness to Christ, but they're like, you know, so, sorry, I just can't you know, be part of this uh, whole story about confession. Yani, what is Abuna going to think about me? Yani, the haram awi. Right? I'm a servant and I look good. But this is part of the process of dying to yourself. This is part of the process of baptism. Baptism is continuous. It's not a one-time shot. And when I go to Abuna, Abuna, I did this and this and this and I feel bad. And as soon as you just say this stuff, as soon as you utter it, what are you letting go of? You're letting go of all your ego. You're letting go of yourself. What are you doing to yourself? You're dying to yourself. You're, you're, in, you're reigniting the power of baptism within you.
Rabbuna gives you the absolution. Come and partake of the body and blood of Christ. I have a question for you. Wouldn't Christ just forgive me my sins if I were to confess it to him? He said, if you confess your sins, he is just and he will forgive you your sins. Why do I need to go to Abuna? You know how confession, the sacrament of confession was in the first few centuries of the church? Someone standing here in front of the congregation. Okay? I did this. I did that. Okay? And I, I can imagine, like, you know, if you have a married couple or if you have children in front of their parents or, like, fudiha. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're like, why do I need to go to Abuna? Back in the time, you needed to stand in front of the congregation. That was the sacrament of confession. Now the church saw it befitting ever since, like, you know, second century, third, because a lot of people got, you know, were, were embarrassed to, to actually confess their sins. Uh, the church chose Abuna as a representative of all the congregation. You confess your sins in front of Abuna, and Abuna with the holy breath, the Holy Spirit that was breathing into him in his ordination, he breathes into you that absolution. And now you, re, uh, uh, you renew your membership in the body of Christ. So when you sin, you're not only sinning to Christ, because I am one with everyone in the church, because of the body and the blood that we partake of, when I sin, I don't only sin to Christ, I sin to you as well. I can offend you as well. And that's why in many services, we work hard, we do all this and that, and sometimes it's just not working. I think we've all been there, right? Like we do everything, and sometimes it's just not working. Remember the story of Achen, the son of Carmi, and their defeat in front of Ai. I was like the small thing compared to Jericho. Can you imagine the Israelites being defeated in front of just a few thousand enemies as opposed to like the tens of thousands that they fought? Why? Because of the sin of one person. One person. I could be the source of failure in a service. I mean, you know, it's so easy to stand up here in a microphone and say this stuff. But actually living it is, is ten times harder. That's why I need to sit with myself every day and judge myself and see what it is that I did wrong. What did I get wrong? And how will this affect me, my relationship with Christ, and my relationship with the members of the body of Christ? It's not only you who's going to be saved alone. Christ will save you and everyone around you the members of the body and the blood of Christ. So, his salvation is continuous. His salvation is ever since the foundation of the world. He has given this all to us. I believe. Am I saved? No. That's the first step, but that's not the end of it. Salvation is also a continuous process. You believe, you die in baptism, and then you renew your death in baptism by confessing your sins. Okay. There's another sacrament that is related to baptism, which I kind of alluded to, and we're not really going to spend too much time on it, but chrismation. What is chrismation? The Myroon. What is it? Do you know? Do you, okay. If, if, I, if I get an encyclical or a letter from the government, for example, it has that stamp. Right? It's issued, it's authenticated by the governor's office. I see the stamp. Right? University here of Houston, for example, if you guys, you know, go there for your education. I want my transcript at the end. How, how do I tell anyone that this is a valid transcript? They're going to be like, show us an official transcript. Why official? Because it has the stamp. I'm a Christian. Really? How do I know? I am stamped. What is that stamp? The Meirun. The Meirun. The holy oil. The holy oil that gives me 
the ability for the Holy Spirit to live within me. But, I mean, great, here I am saved. The Holy Spirit lives within me. No, that's not the end of the story. You need to help the Holy Spirit live within you. That's why St. Paul says, don't anguish the Spirit. You can turn off the Spirit. You can turn off that volume of the Holy Spirit within you. And therefore, I'm a Christian, I have a stamp, but I can't really see it. I can't really see it. So salvation is contingent upon my ability to die to myself by partaking of the sacraments. Baptism, chrismation, confession and repentance. Fourth is, fourth is communion. Okay. How many were in the sermon today in the liturgy? Okay. Not everyone? Maybe? Okay. So, so, so you, you all heard about the institution narrative part, right? The liturgical history behind the institution narrative. Just to expound a little bit more on the liturgy. The liturgy is a means for us to engage with eternity. Okay? Sometimes we take the liturgy as like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to church to, you know, Raiha Khud Barakah. Going to go take a blessing. What are you going to go eat? You're going to eat the body and the bread of, uh, uh, the body and the blood of Christ. You know, it's a, it's a huge blessing. I want you to imagine a Pharisee in the first century, like a real intolerant extremist Pharisee, okay? You know that the Jews sanctified what? What is that thing that they're still fighting on? The, it starts with a T, the temple, right? In place of the temple now, we have a different type of temple. Yes. Uh, so, but the temple was the, you know, was the symbol of God on earth. Like, if I see the temple, I just, you know, there were so many preparatory stages for the people who were going up Mount Zion. There were so many different preparatory stages stages for the Levites, for the priests to undertake before stepping into the sanctuary. It was a very sacred place. Now, can you imagine a Pharisee, an extremist, one who was so, you know, zealous about the Jewish faith? He looks at you and he's like, you are the temple of God. Who said that? St. Paul. <laughs> can you imagine his symbol the symbol of his faith, he's saying, by the way, that symbol is actually you. Why? When you unite physically with the body and the blood of Christ, what happens to you? What happens to your flesh? Is this flesh mine? He, he says, can I take the organs of Christ and sin with them? Excuse me? Those are my ears. Those are my nose. Here are my eyes. Why are you calling them the organs of Christ? Habibi, as soon as you partake of the body and the blood of Christ, it is no longer you who lives. It is Christ who lives in you. you those eyes are not yours. Those ears are not yours. You have to be very careful with them because they are not yours. Well, that's not fair. Where are my rights? Well, congratulations. That's called the ticket of baptism. Your entry into salvation. Baptism means dying with Christ. This is part of the dying. This is part of the let going in life. You know, some people, unfortunately, sometimes we sell Christianity or life with Christ as this, you know, cherry rosy, wonderful thing. You know, everything's going to be great. You know, he saves you. You're going to be happy. It's all good. But in reality, it is fire. It is so difficult. In reality, it was never meant to be easy. Is it, is it easy to be pure in North America or in this world? Probably not. Is it easy to not Lust or not envy or I want this car or especially here. You go like, I don't know, 
go to the mall or go anywhere. It's like, you know, especially Egyptian mothers, they used to spend like two hours shopping. It's like, you were here last week. At least two hours. It's like, you were here last week. Why are you here again? And why are you buying stuff again? Well, I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. And that's part of the, you know, the materialistic world that we live in. You know, the more you get, the more you want. The more you get, the more you want. It's not the opposite. It's like sometimes we think, okay, if I, you know, get A, B, C, خلاص, I'm not going to, I don't want anything else. No. It's the more you get, the more you want. The m- Probably, yes, exactly. The more they give you, the more you spend. But but the deal is, the more you let go, the more satisfied, the more gratified you are. Okay? It is this process of dying to oneself in baptism, in the sacraments, that you earn your salvation in this con- continuity that I was explaining earlier. It's not a one-time shot. It's not a one-time event. It's a continuous process. Next, sacrament. Some sacraments may apply for us, but others may not apply. The unction. There's a prayer in the unction that is very, uh, I think it's said in secret. So Abuna, you know, doesn't offend anyone. Uh, But after he prays the prayers, okay, and then he's like, you know, God, if you are ready to let go of the spirit or release the spirit into your realms by all means. If this is your will, let it be done. I don't, I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not really sure what the exact prayer is. But it's along those lines. Like if you don't heal me physically and you're, you know, the end goal is death, let it be your will. Taban, you know, anyone who hears this, it's like, are you guys suicidal? Are you guys like ready to kill yourself? What's wrong with you? You know, it's like, you're praying to die or let it be a well if you want me to die? What is this? Well, that's the thing. That's the process of baptism. Even if I'm in a, sick st- in a sick state, even if I'm not healthy, even even if I'm not well, maybe that this is the process for culminating my baptism. The culmination of my baptism is in my own death. And maybe sickness or maybe weakness was a means from God to put me into that pathway. That's why St. Paul, he's like, you know, I preached everywhere in the world. I went all over the place. But I have this thing in my back that Christ doesn't want to lift off of me. But it's fine. Why? Because in weakness... My strength is, my power is made perfect, sorry, my, my power in, in weakness is made perfect. My power in weakness is made perfect. When you are weak, you are strong by him. Not, it's not your own strength. Okay, it's not how big your biceps are. It's, it's him, not us. Okay, fifth sacrament. Um, marriage. Did we, sorry, this is the sixth. I'm going to go marriage and priesthood. Marriage and then priesthood. Okay. At a certain point, by the way, monasticism was viewed as like the contrary to marriage or like you know, the parallel to marriage, instead of me being married to someone, I'm marrying, you know, God in that community of monasticism. So my talk applies to kind of both, okay? In any pathway, whether it be marriage, monasticism, celibacy, whatever it is, the first initial spark moments of that relationship are, you know, ideal. They're perfect. You know, you hear all these stories of, I found my perfect partner. I found the perfect person in my life. I found, and so on and so forth, okay? It's so romantic in the beginning. Even in monasticism. You know, when a lot of us as youth go to the, to the uh, uh, monastery, 
you know, and and you you do the khilwas and whatnot. It's like the tasbih in the morning, and like it, I feel like I'm an angel flying, and it's like it's so spiritual, and it's like this is amazing. I would I, I don't mind spending all my life here. Plus, they make perfect food, yani. So, yani, uh, you know, this is a great life. Initially, initially, any process in the beginning has that you know flavor to it that we think is just the sweet you know ultimate flavor that we're going to be you know flying all for for the rest of our lives in but this is not the case this is not the real world you know there's a lot of couples here there are you know the the celibates the monastics and whatnot go to any monk in the monastery and tell them about you know how spiritually uplifted you are they're going to look at you and be like it is beautiful, but there are many things down the road, right? Go to any married couple. Yes, marriage is beautiful and everything, but you know, as soon as you have children and you start raising the children, uh, you know, who wins, dad or mom? And then we get into this fight and which school and which behavior and which conduct. And then all of a sudden you get people regretting, you know, this, this relationship. You get people regretting going down that pathway of monasticism or celibacy. Well, it was never meant to be fun. It was never meant to be, you know, cherry or rosy. I mean, there will always be the bumps on the ride. But this is part of your salvation. Letting go of your desire. A man who wakes up as early as he does in the morning and then comes late at night and Plus, like they can't, they they're blind. They can't see anything. But they give time for their wives, their for their wife, their children, and and their household, and their household. Okay, uh, 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 in the monastery, a monk who, like, literally works twelve hours a day, enters their cell. Khalas, as you are. Like, am I still going to do my canon? How can I read the Akbar? I can't see. I can't see. But it's this, you know, stepping on your desire and going the extra mile. That's also the process of salvation. This is the process of death. You cannot say you believe in Christ Jesus and your behavior or conduct is, you know, is not in this sacrificial realm. I can't say I love Christ Jesus, but as soon as I'm out of here, I, I swear, I cuss, I lust, I then what was going on here? You know, there's something wrong. And that's why the early church always used to focus on this um, it's this beautiful saying found in St. Chrysostom's writing and many other church fathers. They used to call it the liturgy after the liturgy. Does the liturgy end here? No. You become the liturgy outside. You become the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, outside. There's a lot of people who will, you know, start noticing there's something different about this person. There's something different about this or that person. What is it? We don't know. But there's something different about them. You become the Lamb of God. You become a testimony, a martyr of God in society. Last but not least, priesthood. Priesthood. If anyone is called to priesthood, or if you're a, a woman, you know, if you're called to be a consecrated virgin in the church or a deaconess, it is very important to realize that as soon as you put your foot on that pathway of service, you're putting your path, you're putting your foot on the path of death by all means. Service is not an easy task at all. Getting everyone to agree upon the same thing. Letting go of your, you know, your desire as, you know, the head of the servant or the head of the deacons or the head of, you know, if you're a bishop, if you're a patriarch, if you're, I mean, you know, everything comes with its price, right? Yes, I'm, you know, I'm the head of the deacons, but I need to let go of a lot of things so that the deacons can cooperate. Sometimes I need to share the hymnology. I need to share the readings. I need to share this or that so that everyone can participate. 
in service as servants. Sometimes I need to step down my big readings and my theology and my, to, to small young children so that they can understand. This letting go, this constant letting go. And you know, a lot of us, in the process of life, you'll see a lot of people blowing, right? <sighs> like everywhere. You know, this blowing is a sign that you are, you're dying to yourself. But do it out of love. Do it out of love. The end or the conclusion of this is the salvation of the Lord is everlasting. The salvation that he has granted us is eternal. The lamb is slain since the foundation of the world. He has this big storage called salvation. Salvation has been given to the entire world. However, is the entire world saved? No. There's no divinity without humanity. Humanity needs to accept this response from the Lord. The Lord says, I love you all. Does that mean khalas kada? Kullu will uh, be loved? Or, or sorry, does that mean everyone will be saved in this regard? No. You need to return that calling of Christ, that love, by saying, I love you too, and giving up your life, and by participating in the sacramental life of Christ through the sacraments of the church. It is a beautiful mystery that cannot be uh, overlooked. We can't sell it as like, you know, be baptized, go repent and confess and take communion and khalas, you're good for this week. No. No. You know, a very common story that we all know about St. Macarius on his ascent to heaven. You know, the, the, the evil and mighty uh, uh, um, demons that were, you're, you know, were always... We're always trying to daunt him, asking him, are you saved, Macarius? It's like, nope. Are you saved? You, you died. What do you mean, not yet? Are you saved, Macarius? No, nope. no, nope. no. Nope. As soon as he went into the bosom of the Lord in paradise, they cried out, are you saved? And he said, yes. It is no longer I, he who lives in me, therefore I am saved. It is not by word alone. It is not by rites or practices alone. It is a continuous process that we need to reignite on a daily basis. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Sorry, you had a question. Absolutely. Yes. But what I mean to till uh, um, basically the negative infinity until the second coming of Christ or basically until that eternity until we you know, become eternal with Christ um, but see, yes I, I, I mean you have a choice here on earth you get to choose yes or no if you choose no unfortunately there will be no salvation it's, it's, it's very clear to us and to the church and in eternity Yes, you are saved, but you will need an eternity to continue to grow in that very image and likeness of God. God is infinite, and you're 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 not you're a small cell, you're a small member in the body of Christ. And what do we do every day? Um, you know, in the in the psalmody, we praise the Lord every day, and this this will be our work in eternity. Praising God, pondering and contemplating God, as St. Athanasius would put it, so that you can put on the life of Christ. It is no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. The, the hymn that we sing in church, and you'll find Al-Awameed like shaking. Amin, Amin. Your death, O Lord, what? Your death, what? We proclaim. Have you ever seen any religion out there proclaiming the death of their God? 
احنا by the world standards Christians are uh, death here doesn't mean doesn't mean suicide but death means dying to myself I need to accept you as a person created in the image and likeness of God. But I see this and that and this and that that you do that make me, you know, want to not accept you as a person. I need to let go. I need to move, you know, that extra mile and be willing to shake your hands and be willing to serve you if I need. That's that process of baptism. Baptisma or Baptism, as you know, in, 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 in its Greek version, is a dying. It's to die something, you know. Sabra. Can you imagine someone dying you or painting you a different color? It's like you're, 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 this is no longer my identity. Why are you, like, repealing my identity? But this is the process that we go through in baptism. In f- at first it hurts. It really hurts. The, at the end, you become the image of Christ to everyone around you. They see Christ in you. So there's a big reward. I can imagine the martyrs of Libya, you know, as soon as that knife was piercing through, you know, that was not fun. That probably was not the best feeling in the world. But now, it's a very different story. It's a very different story. The, the people who we did not know anything about, I'm sure they had no... En- I think uh, uh, yani, th- we're talking about theology. I'm sure they had nothing to do with theology. Like, like this is like the max they know. Or Aden al maybe. Like, not more than that. But look at them. They became the true witnesses of Christ to the entire world. Now the entire world knows the Coptic Church because of them. Because of one priest called Abu Nabshoi Kamil in, in Alexandria, a lot of people in priesthood and in service tried to imitate that person. Who when he saw you know, one of his daughters in church trying to convert to a different religion, this man was ready to give up his life literally, physically, for her. Like, that's the extent of the love. The extent of the love of a husband to protect his wife and children from any harm. The extent of, I, I will give up my life so that you guys could live. That's the extent. I wouldn't recommend saying it that way to young children. What you would say is love. Be, you know, their ears are very sensitive. You know, try to convey to them love. Love to the neighbor by giving the neighbor. Giving them a candy, giving them a toy, whatever it is. You know, giving to the church, alms. Giving to dad and mom by making a sticker and a card. Like, we, we think this stuff is little. This is not little. This will show them that they give up from their time, from their desire to go play and do whatever it is that they want to enjoy their time. No, we need to you know, stand still a little or we need to sit still a little and just sacrifice some time because we love others. This is the, the, this is the definition. This is the true definition of martyrdom. But you're giving to them in an expression that they can understand. But, you know, if you tell them you need to die with Christ, you know, they're going to get, you know, get into a car accident or something. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Mina for, uh, Yanni, uh, for this great uh, lesson.
and for being with us yesterday and for giving us a sermon today. There is one more session with Dr. Mina tonight, 7.30. Um, this will be for the youth, um, not just the Bible Chat youth, but everybody in high school as well as above. Yani youth uh, up to 60, 70. We are all inclusive. Yani kullu, kullu included, yeah. If you identify as a youth, bardu, yani in today's society, this is fine. Yani <laughs> kullu, that's okay. We accept all. 7.30, we're going to start with prayer. It was supposed to be 7.45, but we'll do it at 7.30. Um, and uh, the topic is going to be, I'm going to tell, we decided on the topic. Abuna turned to me and he's like, how about we talk about, and then he said it. But I won't spoil it for them. I'm only going to spoil it for you in the car. Okay. But it's about something very, very important. Hint, hint, it's about one of the sacraments. It should be okay. Um, okay. But, Yani, I encourage you all to come. Encourage your friends. If there are people not from the church, Yani, American, like non cops, in, in, invite the non cops to come. Yani, this is for everybody. Uh, yani, we would like everybody to attend. And uh, we will have, Bardo, there's a QA form that we have for Dr. Mina, different than the one for Bible chat. If you don't have the link, please reach out to me and I will re I c I'll repost it on the servants group, but I can repost it, Bardo, to you if you, Yani. Uh, send me a message. Uh, let's stand up uh, to pray. Ah. Okay. Which reminds me of another thing. Thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> uh, the middle school and elementary conventions. This is for our kids. These conventions address the issues that our kids face every single day in society and teaches them how to abide in, in Christianity and how to face the confusion of this society. If I told you how many of our children come to me crying in tears, because they are confused at what they should believe, you would be surprised. Encourage your kids to come. Menahi to servants. So far in the registration, we have a few servants that register for the middle school, and there's a few that register for elementary. But the servants is not going to be a word. But I encourage you to in, in, let your kids know to, to register. And you as servants, if you're available, it would be wonderful to have you. We need as many servants as possible. If there's trouble with, with the cost because you have يعني, more than one child and يعني, both of y'all, you and your husband or you and your wife are servants, talk to Abuna or, I, or myself or to, or to Uncle George. Sorry, I said Uncle George because there is youth as well. يعني, no offense. But, يعني, okay. but talk to one of us and, يعني, يعني, and we, will, we will see how we can help. But please, it's important for us to participate with our other churches and, and with these diocese activities it's for you, it's not for us. We have our priest conventions and they're very fun. But what about for the kids and for the servants? I, yes, we are, we are trying to plan. We are trying to plan one. Yani, it's, it's on my list of like a million and 250 things. 251 things now. The group, come on. Oh, that's wonderful. So we will have a servants, yes, but it's very important that we should have a servants convention. But please, elementary and middle school. If you don't have the links with the QR code and the link for registration, please let me know and I, will, I don't mind reposting. Okay? Yes. Thank you for bringing this point. I will share this. Um, Jan, if you need this report, s send to me individually and I'll share it with you. I don't want to share this with you. It's not for everybody. Be, I mean, some of us don't serve middle school or elementary. But if you want this, please send me a reminder, and I will text you uh, who from our church registered for both. It might take a little bit of time for me to get the elementary one because that's what the Buna Polycarpus. So when I'm, I'm at the mercy of his response. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the transportation, we will set that up. I wanted to set up a meeting this week, but we, I mean, there was no time. With We had board meeting on Friday, and then, of course, we have uh, our wonderful retreat with Dr. Mina. So 
expect a message from me by, by tomorrow to set up a time for us to, to, talk, to have a meeting for all the servants who said that they would help um, and anybody else who wants to help for us to uh, start talking about these logistics of the transportation, how many buses we need, etc. Uh, the activities, uh, uh, good news. I confirmed with the, uh, with the campsite, we have all the activities, okay? Some of them, there are so many activities that some of them we can't even, like BB guns, for example. We're not doing that, but they have so many activities. They have like axe throwing, and they have zip line, and they have like all these things, and, and I was able to, of course, thanks to y'all, but I was able to tell them, we're taking, we're, we're taking uh, the whole campsite, work with us, but they're like, we'll, uh, we'll give you all the activities for free. So we have all the activities. This is going to be, it's going to be wonderful. I don't know how I'm going to do zip lining in a Galabaya, but I'll figure it out. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. This is a very good point that needed clarification. So what's going on is it's a huge campsite, okay? But it has two wings, a north wing and a south wing. Well, yeah, north and south or like northeast. Anyway, two wings. Each wing has its own buildings, its own qa'at, like its own halls for the, for the lectures, and its own activities. Like they have, yani, and if there's like premium activities that are shared, we won't be doing them in the same time. There will be no interaction between elementary and the middle school side except for one thing, and that's the liturgy with Sayyidina and Begregi. The liturgy, which is most likely going to be on Friday, the morning that we leave, will be everybody combined. That's combined. But even the food halls and everything, separate because it's such a big يعني, campsite. So hopefully, if we, don't get, uh, if we don't get excommunicated from them like we do, then we can do this in the next year. If we don't get kicked out, يعني, then we'll be able to do this more often. But it's really nice. Me and Abuna went and we, we saw it. Me and Abuna Polikarpos, we took a tour. The people are very nice and the facilities are very, very nice. And the lake, the lake, Five star. Okay. Any other questions? If you have any concerns or anything like that, please reach out to Abu Nathanasis or myself. And we're more than happy to uh, yeah, handle any questions or concerns. Glory be to God for a moment. Let's stand up for prayer. Finally, O Lord, to the intercession of St. Mary and Archangel Raphael, all the choir of your saints, we ask you, O Lord, to always give us a spirit of discernment. Help us to serve, O Lord, with, with realization of the responsibility that you gave us. Help us understand how important the salvation is and that you gave us the salvation, but it's for us to reach out and accept the salvation that you give us. Help us always feel the value of the sacraments and the blessing that we have of being part of this beautiful church. Bring all those who, who have fallen, who went astray, help bring them back, O Lord. Help us to, to, to do our responsibility to the best of our abilities. Feed us with your body, with your blood, and with your gospel, and, and hear us, Lord, we pray to you thankfully, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And now the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. I have some extra urban. I will be at the door if you would like some extra orban.